I spent 100 days playing Pal World, and you're about to experience every step of the way. Pokemon and Ark had a baby, then reached out to me saying, play me, and I couldn't refuse. This is one of the hottest video games on the market right now, and you're about to see why. Pals can be enslaved or befriended, equip machine guns or rocket launchers. But aside from that, we can build immaculate bases with auto farms thanks to our Pal workers. Can I catch every single Pal and beat all bosses within 100 days? Let's find out. Before starting my journey, I spent some time creating my gorgeous character which I was quite satisfied with. Day one, I loaded into windswept hills, naked and afraid, but determined to make a name for myself on this beautiful island. As I've already played through this game two times, I decided to steamroll through the tutorial quests. I made a workbench to start and followed along with what the game wanted me to do. I gathered some resources off the ground and picked some berries for an early food source to make sure that I'd stay nice and full. Like I said in the intro, I'm shooting to catch every single pal in the entire game by day 100, so it's never too soon to start. Cativo was the first victim to my fists of fury. After the successful capture, Lamp Ball came next. I pretty much caught every starter pal with the exception of this level 38 Mamarest because, well, yeah, I can't. One day I'll catch this big green booger, and he'll be a great companion. Capturing pals is the best way to gain experience in Pal World, even more so than killing enemies, and with that, I had a few levels to pump. This entire playthrough, I'll only be leveling stamina, health, and carrying capacity. Leveling anything else is a waste, and you'll see why. Day one is a long one, so please bear with me, there's a lot to cover. So instead of building in the spawn area, I chose to instead go out and explore to find a base location that would better suit me. And luckily, in this game, it doesn't matter where you build, because you can fast travel travel to and from your base as you please. While exploring, anytime I'd find a new pal, I'd make sure to catch it to get closer to my goal. After some time, I rolled up on my first syndicate Hell tower, yeah. which we'll touch on later, but I was getting closer to where I wanted to be. Running up the hill a little bit brought me to a syndicate thug camp where a poor little pangolet was encaged, so I murdered every last thug and freed the little blue guy. But in reality, he went from being a prisoner to my slave, so was it really a W for the little man? As the day was coming to a close, I remembered a nice flat base area, but to get across the ravine, I needed a glider, so after crafting one, I soared across and pressed forward. The sun was falling fast, and I needed a place to call home, so I found myself in the red forest, freezing, and yes, still naked. I caught a daydream to finish everything off, and tomorrow, the adventure really begins. As day two was beginning, I came across a stone stairway leading to a fast travel point, but that wasn't the exciting part. The beach that laid behind it is what I was after. A vast open field, flat as can be, and plenty of beginner resources to get me started. So I decided I'd claim the surrounding area by placing down a pal box, giving me some decent real estate for starts. I immediately began construction, placing down wooden foundations, and mapping out where I wanted things to go. Let's be honest, at the moment, wood was a struggle, but it's because of weight and stamina restrictions, but I made do. Chopping trees and building ate up a big portion of my day. My first designated helper at my base was Kativa, who is a good all-around worker when it comes to chores. We built some pal beds because my little slaves get stressed the hell out when they can't sleep. I mean, I can't blame them. Aside from building a functional ranch, I also needed to complete this stuff to upgrade my base level through the pal box. When you level said box, you get bonuses such as increased amount of bases allowed, or just assigning more pals to each base. Within a few minutes, I had myself an auto pal food farm, which which basically has pals planting, watering, growing, and harvesting their own food, which they deposit into their own feed box. Shortly after, I made myself a club so I could deal more than just fart damage to pals when trying to catch them. I headed back to the New Beginnings area to capture the five lamp balls for the tutorial and finish that up as well. I returned home with some cloth to my name, so now I could craft a full armor set to finish off the day. Day three, my current base level was at five, and the tutorial wanted that number to be seven, which I was close to, but also kind of far off due to step six needing smelted iron. But no obstacle is too obstacle-y for your- that's not a word. Anyways, it's like a saddle workbench, but cooler. Every pal in the game with a saddle or a gun option has to have their item crafted in the bench first. Once doing so, it immediately goes into your inventory and automatically works with the corresponding pal whenever they are roaming and on your team. Following this, I erected the Statue of Power, finishing off base level 5 and moving my way up in the world. The Statue of Power will allow me to use the little green effigies I find throughout the world to increase my capture rate when throwing spheres at wild pals. Before going out on my next adventure, I noticed that was low on spheres, and to make those I needed pallium fragments. Back to the New Beginnings area again. Here there are a few deposits that drop five fragments when mined, and I did exactly that when out of the corner of my eye I noticed a lurking ichthyr deer that I knew I needed to have. I took my trusty club plus fox parks and two wild angry cativas to get his health low before attempting to capture it. This is how it went. Fox park kick his butt. There we go. They're already putting the work in on the deer. Come on, ichthyr deer. Be mine. Be mine. Let's go! That's huge. That is huge. 
After catching the deer and grabbing a nearby effigy, I mined some fragments, then made my way back home. I made a few goodies like a mining site which allows my pals, who have the ability, to auto farm stone. Shortly after, I made a rush ore saddle and began using his charge attack to mine stone, which as you can see is quite efficient. After gathering what stone I needed, the next thing on the agenda was the logging site, which does pretty much the same thing as the mining pit except for wood. Last but not least, to finish off the day, I made a crusher which can convert stone into powdium fragments, and with that, my base is now at level 7. What an eventful day. Time to hit the hay. Day 4, I wanted to challenge the Penguin King boss that resided in a portal right next to my base. But I needed more than a club and a dream, so I crafted myself an old bow and a few arrows to hopefully, hopefully, get the job done. Foreshadowing? I got my ass kicked! Anyways, now that I had some range, I could capture flyers because without range, most of the time you can't get their attention. So with this, I saw a nearby Nightwing, which I figured could be a massive upgrade for my team, and I began damaging it. With a low capture rate, it took me quite a few tries, but nonetheless, I was successful. Okay, now it's time to fight Pen King. I used a boss teleporter to head inside when I was faced with three baby penguins and the king himself. This would have been an easy win, but the fact that the three pangolets have aimbot, my death was inevitable with the pen king sending me to heaven. But maybe it was a fluke, let's try again. I swapped out some team members and headed straight back for round two. It went a lot worse this time. The little pangolets are way too strong for their own good, so we'll come back to this. I headed back to the new beginnings and began catching everything in sight to finish off the 30 captured pals tutorial quest. Some deer, an alpaca, and a night wing later, I had all 30 and the last part i needed to do was challenge and defeat the first syndicate boss aka the first gym leader when i returned home i noticed that i finally had enough resources to craft a furnace which would allow me to smelt metal now and metal is important for literally any blueprint past level 15 so this is going to help a lot later on day five started off chill with me enjoying the view of my little pal slaves making me rich look at how good they transport resources back and forth i decided to actually help for once and place two storage boxes next to both the mining pit and the logging site for shorter transporting distance for both the pals and myself doing this saves a lot of time and the fact that this game allows you to craft things as long as the resources are in a chest somewhere within the base range makes this viable as well. Not having to have resources in your inventory to craft is one of my favorite things about this game. After some chores around the base, I wanted to craft a deer saddle, but I was short on, you guessed it, podium fragments. So back to the start for the 30th time. When I fast traveled over, I noticed a gigantic pangolet was wandering around with a shiny animation around him, which is basically a rarer version of the normal pal with a special ability. And I think I know what it is. I did some easy damage and caught it first try just for the memes, but honestly, I'll never use it. Is this like a shiny Pokemon? No, it's not because it's not a Pokemon Sizen. Is this a shiny pal? But like his colors look normal. Back home, craft Ekthir Deer Saddle five minutes later and get a crippled finger from holding F to craft and I can ride my deer. My next plan was to head to the desert to get myself some turtles. Digitosis, Digtosis, whatever you want to call them, are the best miners in the game. And if I can catch a few this early, I'll be rich in metal in no time. But first, I need a tropical outfit so I don't overheat. After traveling to a different area and getting all things necessary plus a Bulbasaur wannabe, I came across my first open world boss and I couldn't go home without it. Chalette is one of my most favorite pals in this entire game. So let's get it. It was an easy fight for the most part, but when it came time to capture, he gave me some issues almost killing me. But by nightfall, I finally got there. I spent the night down by the shore, killing certain pals for pal fluids and also catching everything I saw that I haven't acquired yet. Day six, I took the resources gathered to make a tropical outfit, giving me light protection from the heat. I hopped on my deer for a long expedition out to the desert. Beforehand, I made 21 pal spheres, which would hopefully be enough to get a few turtles and whatever else I saw along the way. We headed for the middle of the map, where the small desert biome was sides, and the journey wasn't too notable. I caught a floppy, but <laughs> everything else was too low of a capture rate, and I didn't want to waste precious spheres at the moment. After quite a bit of searching, I finally saw the beautiful orange sands across the river, and I headed straight for it. So here's what they don't tell you in the brochures. There's taco tacos all over the desert biome, and uh, these birds are little suicide bombers on crack. They one-tap you no matter what if they're close and they explode, and yes, they're aggressive. So treading carefully through the desert was a must. After heading in a little further. I'm pretty sure I experienced a bug or just got really lucky, but there was five Digtoses right next to each other, and my goal was to get all of them. The hard part, though, is fighting off five Bowsers that spin and shoot water at you. I played the long game, chipping away at one turtle at a time. I captured the first one quick, and the second one followed shortly after, but it was the next two that were a bit of a pain, as I only had regular spheres left. And with a capture rate of 8%, you can only expect so much. I ran out of spheres and walked away with four out of five, but that's a win in my books. Okay, so here's where 
her ADHD hurt me. I was going to roll out and head back home, but I noticed some Lovanders nearby, which I only saw one time in my previous playthrough out of about 40 hours. Maybe I was unlucky, or maybe they're just rare, but I had to try and get one. Little did I know they were absolute crackheads. And after getting charged and AoE'd, I died what? dropping all of my gear at my place of death. Day 7, I made some basic cloth armor so I wouldn't freeze and immediately went back out to try and recover my items. I made it back to the desert where I died, and unfortunately, the Love Enders were gone, but at the same time, maybe it was a blessing in disguise. I scoured the entire desert for a fast travel point, but was unsuccessful, and I didn't want to run all the way home, so I guess I'm gonna look for more. I searched the grassy hills and came across an encampment where some syndicate thugs were holding a pal hostage in a cage, so my first objective was to murder every single one of them and then get the little guy. We can always leave it up to Ichthyr, dear, to obliterate anything in our paths. After clearing the camp, I set the Dazzy free, getting me one step closer to my goal of capturing every single pal. Let's go. And it was all meant to be, because right up the road, there was a fast travel point allowing me to head back home to safety. When I got back, I deployed my very first turtle to showcase his mining skills, and I'll let it speak for itself. He's just gonna go nuts on these rocks. Watch this, watch this. Look how fast it is. What? <laughs> I spent the next three minutes holding F yet again to craft the Digtoe's headband, which allows me to throw the turtle out. And as long as it's near an iron vein, it'll go absolutely nuts, spinning like crazy and mining the hell out of iron. This will come into play later on when I make an auto iron farm. But for the rest of the day, I took my newfound turtle and mined as much iron as possible for near future upgrades. Day 8, I spent my entire morning crafting nails so I could upgrade to a high quality workbench, which just allows me to craft more and better high quality items than the regular workbench. And now with everything I've been grinding out, I could now craft a crossbow. This is by far one of my favorite weapons in this entire game. It has an amazing damage output for early and mid game, plus a fast reload. I also added Shalette to my team because down the road it could be an excellent fighter and a couple drinks and a bad idea later i headed back to the pen king for my revenge i will get this ugly oversized penguin i promise you the fight went a lot smoother this time with me killing the three pangolets quickly leaving big boy vulnerable only a few spheres later he was mine and i basked in glory though at this point he wasn't all that great so adding him to my team didn't make any sense instead i'd later use him for level two watering making my life a little easier after all that nonsense i crafted a medicine workbench which as it states allows me to craft medicine mostly used for power with status ailments. With this done, I can now upgrade my base once again. For the next upgrade, which is the important one because it gives me access to a second base, I needed a lot of iron. And since I didn't have my auto farm up and running, I had to do it the old-fashioned way by gathering it myself and transporting it back to the base. So I put Kativa in my team and brought Digtoast to the church to start farming. Kativas, like a few other pals in this game, give you a passive weight increase just by being in your squad, which is really overpowered. This went on for the rest of the day, me just farming iron at the church and hauling it back home. Beaten and bruised, I needed a break, so I headed back and went to bed. But everyone's getting tired, so it's time for bed. Day 9, with my cooler box crafted, all that was left was a sphere workbench, so I got that crafted as well, and shortly after, my base was at level 10. This now means I can have a second base location anywhere on the map that I'd like that I can fast travel to and from. I headed straight for the church where all the iron was and placed down another pal box. Afterwards, I laid out some foundations for a little work area and got some pal beds placed too. The last step was to make an auto food farm so that the pals here wouldn't starve, and then a furnace to smell ore as it farms here. Blood, sweat, and tears led to the base finally being on autopilot towards the end of the day and I couldn't be happier. I went back to home base and noticed a wandering dinosaur, which is a very strong early game fighter. And with this added to my team, I might be able to take down the first boss. Chalet icicles and a few arrows later, I captured the little green dino first try. When the skies grew dark, I went to base two to check on things and noticed my turtle was feeling down because of bad working conditions, which doesn't make sense, but okay. Then out of nowhere, two of my pals became incapacitated for literally no reason. Day 10, and first things first, I crafted myself a mega shield, which gives me additional protection. It recharges over time if I go a certain amount of time without oh, taking yeah, damage, which is excellent for survivability. And without wasting another yeah, second, fine, I decided it was finally time hard. for me to challenge the first main story boss. I only have 100 days to complete this game, and if I don't start now, I'll never finish. I fast traveled over to yeah, Rain Syndicate Tower and loaded in. I'll let most of this fight speak for itself, see, but just uh, know this. The boss has 30,000 health, and while it may be a big fluffy off-brand Electabuzz, it hits hard and can wipe your entire team quick if you don't finesse things.
Ichthyrdir is just soaking so much damage. Okay, not that attack. That attack hurts a lot. I gotta shoot Zoe if I wanna do the damage. Let's go, let's go. Oh! Yeah. Almost let him die. Ichthyrdir is just a tank, man. Hmm. We're doing great so far. All right, we're gonna switch it out. Go ahead, Nightwing. Do your thing. See how good you are. Not as good as Ichthyrdir, but you know what? We're getting the job done. Shaled helps me clean up the boss, and I swooped in for the final shot, taking down Zoe and Grisbolt. I'm one step closer to finishing all five bosses. After leaving the boss arena, I noticed a small cave opening next to the fast travel point and decided to run it. These are like mini dungeons that are fairly easy, but have a lot of rare ores in it and catchable bosses at the end. I went through catching any uncaught pals and also farming up every bit of Powdium I saw. The Powdium deposits in these caves offered a lot more than the normal rocks, allowing me to rack up about 200 before leaving the dungeon. A few syndicates get thugs and some pal cruelty later, I made it to the boss, which was a Tombat. The difference between boss variants are that they're a tad bit larger than their normal counterparts and have higher stats. I fought this thing down to a whopping two health and captured it quite easily. Afterwards, I grabbed both chests and scurried home fast because I was about to starve. To finish off this glorious day, I went to fight King Pekka. We went back and forth, trading blows and belly flops until nightfall when I captured him and added another boss to my arsenal. A beautiful day 10, if you ask me. Day 11 began with me being raided by Lovanders at my second base, which worked out perfectly. The only issue is trying to keep all of my pals from completely smearing them before I could capture one. Luckily, one of the 1 HP Lovanders dipped, and before I knew it, I had one for myself. I went back to home base to prepare for a trip because I really wanted to go out and explore, but I've been short on pal spheres and arrows, so exploring felt pointless when there wasn't a reason for it. I began crafting 70 megaspheres and some arrows for my crossbow, which took longer than I wanted it to. Not to mention my newly acquired Lovander was giving me some issues when it came to working for me. Unfortunately, I didn't finish crafting until late in the day, so instead of venturing off in the dark, I made some pelt armor, which was way better than what I was currently using, and then I laid down for some much needed rest. Day 12, my adventure began. I traveled to a grassy area where I began catching everything in sight, from weird flower chicks, to cinemoths, to bristlas, and even a catchers I caught at the beginning of this dungeon. Catchers was an important one, though, because she was actually pretty damn strong for mid-game activities, and I wanted her on my team ASAP. I can Continued through the cave, catching pals and killing free pal alliance members until I came across an open room with suicide bomber bees, and you bet your ass I wanted no part of it. Just kidding, I poked one with an arrow because I needed to fill out this pal dex whether I blow up or not. After getting the bee guard's health low, I threw a sphere and got it first try. The final boss ended up being a floppy, which I already had, but I figured why not get the boss variant. After 10 wasted spheres, I gave up and decided to kill it before grabbing my loot and leaving. Day 13, I traveled over to base 2 and noticed that Celeri was incapacitated and my turtle had a fracture. From what I've noticed, not being around a base for a certain amount of time causes status ailments. At my home base, I've never had a pal get sick or hurt, but that's just my theory. Anyways, back out we go. It was time for me to start catching all of the mid-game pals, starting with Gale Claw. Next was Robin Quill, followed by me rescuing an Arsox from a free pal alliance camp. I continued down the path and found out that right around the corner was an Elphadran, which is one of my favorite pals as well. And with me being level 24, I should have a fighting chance at getting it, so let the battle commence. Oh gosh. No, dude, I got stuck on a rock. All right, yeah, we're gonna back up. I'm really scared because I'm low health. One more attack from this thing and I'm dead. Use your fire attack. Yeah, that thing, that does a lot of damage. Please don't hurt me. What? It was disappeared. Oh, After trading this. blows, I attempted to capture it and noticed my capture rate was a heaping 5%. But my luck flows yes. like a river when it comes to video games. And I got it on the seventh try. Day 14, I went through my technology and unlocked a few things that I found necessary when I realized I was already at the required level to craft an Elphadran saddle. All I was missing was fiber, which you get from chopping away at trees. So here's to becoming a lumberjack. I saw the rates as I was chopping and remembered that there were metal tools in the game for a reason. So after crafting Crafting a metal pickaxe and a metal axe, I got back to chopping down trees. But then I got sidetracked and started building a ranch, which I slept on last playthrough. These are a fantastic way of getting very specific resources like wool from lamb balls or eggs from chickens. This led to me completing more requirements for my base to get it up to the next level by building a cooking pot, a mill, and a wheat farm. And then I got sidetracked again and started adding another work area to my base. But this time I built with stone because, you know, my base needs contrast instead of just 
being all ugly and wooden. Dude, what is wrong with me? All I wanted was an Alpha Dran saddle, and now I have half of a defensive wall around my base. And damn it, it's already bedtime. Day 15, I hung out on the deck while my pal slaved away, because I'm pretty sure I went to go get a bowl of frosted mini wheats. After breakfast, I decided to treat my pals at base 2 and finally built them a hot spring. They deserve it. I mean, they've worked their butts off to give me, like, not even 100 iron, but still, they deserve it. Afterwards, I began working on my Great Wall yet again. Placing these spike walls perfectly is literally impossible, and by the time I was done, there was a huge gap. Afterwards, since I was already in a building type mood, I went ahead and worked on my concrete workshop, adding some weird angle walls with some roofs for God knows what, but it makes me happy building with structures other than walls and floors. And finally, after all of that, I began crafting the Alpha Dran saddle, which I saw was going to take a while, so I let my pals finish it up. While that was working itself out, I attempted to craft a weapon workbench to again upgrade my base, but absolutely hated the fact that I had a little cube bedroom, so I dismantled it, creating more space, made a little house for myself out back. Through all of this fighting and killing, we can still keep our humanity by building a house. Or at least that's what I tell myself. Day 16, after reorganizing the previous day, I placed down my weapon workbench, which allows me to craft any weapon past the crossbow. Handguns, long rifles, auto rifles, etc. And while I was at it, I also crafted a hip lantern, which comes from the ancient technology tab. When you kill or capture bosses, you get ancient technology points, which can unlock special craftables that would otherwise be locked. This makes it to where I don't have to hold a torch at nighttime anymore, freeing up my hands for, let's say, a weapon. After my mega ADHD squirrel-like moment, the Alpha Dran saddle was finally complete, and it was time for a test run. While most flyers in this game have terrible stamina, it's still extremely convenient being able to fly on top of structures that would otherwise be unreachable. Next up for me was to head to the Ford, which was southeast-ish. I needed to get more of the map discovered, and I figured I'd just work my way up. When I arrived, I saw a level 31 Memorist, and decided to go for it. I probably wouldn't use it, because I'm going for an all-dragon team, but it still fills out the PAL deck. And although it was a high-level Memorist, I still got it on the first try with a low capture rate. I'm telling y'all, my luck will never run dry. But my trip ran short because I was low on arrows, which I started crafting before I left, and when I returned home, I noticed something funky. On single player, when you leave your base render distance, your pals and everything at your base comes to a halt, meaning crafting and farming stops. This is going to make everything more challenging, but we'll find ways around it, don't worry. When I left my base again, I came across a thug camp with a lucky chicken being my second encounter this playthrough with one of these rare pals, and you already know I couldn't resist. Shortly after, I came across a grin tail boss out in the open, which means I gotta spend the next five minutes dodging and shooting arrows until I can throw some blue balls at it and make it come home with me. Funny how that works. As you probably noticed, day 16 was a long and very eventful day. As much as I'd love to tell you every last detail, I don't have the time, but for one more important event was fighting and capturing the Masanda Lux boss, which is an oversized Pikachu panda on steroids. Damn it, that's a tree. Where are you going, man? Dinosaur's just knocking this thing around like it's a freaking balloon. It's kind of nice, though. You can never attack me. 17, I was still out exploring when I came across a weird platform area with lights, and I was mad curious, so I headed towards it. As I got closer, I realized it was the beloved Black Marketeer. I never saw or captured him last playthrough, but I know he sells Black Market Pals, and if you capture him, it's basically your own personal pal vending machine that rotates daily. Unfortunately, I'm not a high enough level to attempt to capture it, nor do I have high enough quality spheres. So for now, we're just here to say hi and then move along. While jogging down the shore, I saw a chest I wanted and I grabbed it, but behind me was a Jormantide, which is scary as hell and especially this early on. We'll get him one day. Today's just not that day. I came across the crack in the earth, which is a long strip of lava ranging for miles, and some new pals decided to show their faces. I caught a Kelpsy Ignis, followed by a Goriath, and then an Elizabeth, which by the way was a very careful fight because she's always accompanied by suicide bees. Next came Flame Bell, and then finally a Wixen. Okay, damn, I went off there, not gonna lie. With that out of the way, I decided to relax this evening and grab a bunch of effigies when the sun went down, because it's easier to locate them in the dark. Day 18, I returned home to a ranch full of wool and two thousand plus stone, which was an amazing feeling knowing I didn't have to do an ounce of work to get it. Immediately after, I made my way to my statue of power to use my newly found effigies to increase my capture power by three levels, which is huge. After checking on base 2's iron production and seeing that it was next to nothing since I last checked, I knew I had to do something about it. Before doing anything else though, I crafted another fluffy pal bed and deployed one more pal to meet the requirements for base level 13. At the end of the day, I deployed my other two Digtoses that were at home base, but at base two for even more iron production. I was hoping this would kick up my game a notch and I figured while that was going and nighttime was upon us that I could go catch a few pals that were nighttime exclusive. I started with hoop crates, then his big brother Cognito. Day 19, I found another thug camp, but this one was a little bit higher of a level. I noticed a flamethrower 
a thug and figured maybe I should capture him. It would be payback for all the pals they imprison, or at least that's what I tell myself to get over the fact that I just put a human being in a grapefruit-sized ball. Okay, so normally I wouldn't do this in a normal fun run of this game, but seeing as it's a 100 days, I feel like I have to try everything. So I crafted the Pangolet rocket launcher because I thought it might actually be OP, but it was going to take a century to craft, so the showcase is going to have to wait. Here's where I had to sacrifice some of my time in progression, though, because of a single player issue. I headed over to base two and decided to go AFK for a few days while iron produced because being out of render distance, like I said before, I'd never get the iron I needed for the future. Day 20, while still being AFK, you could see that while being here, the turtles farmed a lot more iron than they normally would if I was gone. I also got down to literally one health from starving, but who needs food when you have all this iron? I returned to the keyboard midday to revel in my riches and pick up all the farmed iron for a total of 323 or a smelted total of 161 iron ingots. Not too shabby for one day. Later, I headed back to home base to finish up the rocket launcher and then craft some precautionary heat resistant pelt armor for when I went back to the desert. Okay, okay, okay. Now for the Pangolet rocket launcher. I wasn't expecting it to look like this, but it's actually hilarious that someone had the idea in their mind that a penguin would make for an excellent explosive for a rocket firing weapon. I'm going to bring it with me and use it on a boss, but seeing as it immediately incapacitates the pangolet, it doesn't seem viable or meta worthy, but we'll see. Anyways, the last thing I wanted to do today was go capture Patalia, which is a grass type boss. And seeing as I wanted to ditch Ichthyr deer at some point, I decided I'd go make an Arsok saddle, which is a fire type ram thing. But unfortunately, he could only jump about as high as my 47 pound cat and he didn't have a double jump, but, but he is a fire type, which is super effective against grass. So it should help me take her down pretty easily. Anyways, it's time to finally face her. I can't say Arsox is bad because he carried most of this fight, but she did almost kill me multiple times. And towards the end, she actually killed Arsox. I cleaned up the damage with Catrice and then threw a sphere capturing her on the very first try. Well, Pangolet rocket launcher. Why is it even in the game? That's all I'm going to say. Day 21, I woke up and cooked some fried eggs for myself because I deserve a balanced breakfast. Afterwards, I headed over to base two because I needed to spend some time tending to iron farming. I was always short and being here mining it myself will just give it to me faster. I finished up some other requirements while I was at it so I could craft a sphere assembly line, which this makes sphere crafting way faster nails. as well. This is what most of my day looked like and all of these things take time but are highly necessary. Day 22, I headed out to farm electric organs, which you can get by catching or killing electric type pals. I began with a few sparkets, then discovered my first ever jolt hog, which I needed for the pal deck anyways, so I caught everyone in sight. There were about 30 of them all around this area, so finishing up, I had more than enough organs to craft what I needed. I was at it for a while, but when I finished, I ventured out to a nearby fast travel point. I was gonna go home, but of course there had to be a few new pals nearby, like this Willy Wonka cotton candy lamb, and this Mal Christ locked in a cage that I freed. I even captured three brawn cherries for later farming teams, because while in your inventory, they give you 100 extra carrying capacity, per one. Afterwards, I ran into another black marketeer, but this time I went for the capture, which was a terrible idea. Man's had a minigun and shredded through health like it was nothing. I played around with him for a little while and actually got his health low, but the thing is, he ended up getting glitched into a wall, so he forever belongs to the hills. I think this was fate though, because behind me were some van worms, which are the best transporters in the game, and I of course needed them for my iron farm. After capturing as many as possible, I headed home for the evening to find out my ranch had produced way more wool and flame organs than I would ever need. Ranch OP. Good night. Day 23, I wanted to craft the generator, which is why I farmed all of those electric pals, but I noticed I was short by just one, and I didn't want to go all the way back out to get one more, so I did something that I'm not proud of. Yes, for the first time and the last time ever, I butchered a pal, and I feel terrible about it. Anyways, now I can make a generator. With this, all of my assembly lines that are nearby will be powered and able to be used, which is going to increase my crafting speed by a lot. And electric panda that I got earlier will be great at powering this thing. While checking out my pal deck later on, I got motivated knowing that I already encountered 78 different pals and registered 68, meaning I'm about halfway done. Yes, it's early. I get that, but it's going to get a lot harder when it comes to the late game pals and tower bosses. The last thing I did on day 23 was head to the first black market tier to try again. The only difference is this mother had a level 40 cognito that he deployed, which I wasn't expecting, ending with my death, of course. My goodness. Day 24, I crafted two egg incubators, which can be easy free experience every five minutes or so. Plus, 
Just finding rarer eggs can get me rarer pals that I haven't seen or captured yet. Shortly after, I crafted a production assembly line, which is a workbench, but with, again, faster crafting speeds. Now for the fun stuff. I left base to go find probably my top two favorite pal, which is Quivern. I found the teleporter while flying, and if it wasn't for me knowing about this boss, I'd be extremely intimidated by the giant dragon statue right next to it. Let's get it. This whole encounter is super odd because they made a really strong endgame type boss be a super low level, so this fight is somewhat easy, and now I have an OP dragon that I can take down most mid-game threats with. That evening, my scorching eggs were done incubating, and while they only gave me a level 1 fox parks and a level 1 flame bell, it's still free experience, I guess. Day 25, I immediately got on top of crafting more pal spheres as I was running low. Afterwards, I made a high quality hot spring, which looks dope by the way, but this should keep my pals mood peachy for a long time. I went back over to base 2 for some AFK time, but for some reason, I looked at this fruit bowl for the entire time, so I don't have much to show here. When I returned, my next goal was to capture some more bosses to rack in those ancient parts for high tier crafting. And my my first target was as a rope. Though this thing was a low level, do not underestimate it because I almost died multiple times. After the capture was successful, the day was coming to an end, so I went home to finish off some egg hatching. Day 26, I gathered my expensive sellables and went off to the small settlement to sell them at the merchant. I wanted to save up in case I ever came across a pal merchant selling rare pals or for leather purchases down the road. I then headed to a small cave to try and find the last two cave pals I needed, being Fuddler and Mao. It didn't take long for Fuddler to appear, which was an easy catch, and shortly after Mao and his buddy came out of hiding. And of course, this wasn't much harder than Fuddler. The last two pals I needed before being done with all of the early game pals was Hangyu and Toko Toko, which worked out perfectly because the dungeon boss ended up being a Hangyu. My luck continues. I danced with the boss for a minute or so until he was low enough to capture, grabbed my loot, and was on my way. By dusk, I had found the desert again and found myself face to face with the Toko Toko. And with that, my friends, phase one is complete. I was planning on going home to get some sleep, but right outside the desert was a Hell Zephyr, who I I failed to catch earlier this playthrough, so it was time to redeem myself. Day 27, while still on the move, I headed to the Goblin Turf area to grab the fast travel point, which is extremely dangerous. Grabbing the attention of even one of these gobfins can trigger all of them, and they're complete psychopaths, so don't do that. I then traveled home and used some of the flour that I've been hoarding along with berries to make a hefty amount of jam-filled buns. They're super easy to cook and offer a lot of nutrition and sanity, which can keep those pals nice and healthy. Day 27 was a big catch-up and egg-hatching day, so I won't bore you to death with that. The evening was interesting though. I went to challenge Bushi, which is by far one of the coolest looking fire types in this game. Of course, he was no match for Quivern, but nonetheless, a cool ass pal. After Bushi came Bronze Cherry Aqua, being the variant of the normal Bronze Cherry, but this one was a little harder. Being locked in a tiny cave like circle with this behemoth is pretty damn scary. Quivern died. My dog squeaking the squeaky toy. I'm about to die. No! You have a very strong dinosaur on you. Why are you focused on me? Wow, because this Bronze Cherry is actually really strong. Come on, let me do the cool cinematics here. Me just looking like a badass trying to catch a brown cherry. There we go. Day 28, I did some more home chores and cleaned out my inventory since it was cluttered from the previous adventure. I then spent half the day gathering ore at base 2, followed by crafting that much needed Giga Shield, which doubles my shield, putting me at 520 now. Something else I've been putting off for a while is crafting metal armor because I didn't want to waste the iron when it's already so hard to come by. But I can hardly call this a 100 days if I don't do that, so whatever, let's make metal armor. I then headed back to Gobfin Turf to grab some PAL fluids before taking on the next boss. Next up is Warsect who actually put in the work on me. This guy is a mega tank with defense higher than any of my strongest pals attack stats, so it was a slow and steady race. I was about to try to get that back bonus, but we got it. Day 29, I once again gathered boss sellables and headed back to the small settlement, this time to buy leather because repairing my metal armor needed it and I was short. I'm sure I'd need it for other things too, but this was my main focus. Not too long after, I headed to another boss teleporter being Verdash, who is very strong. At this point, this was the highest level enemy I've attempted to fight with him being level 35 and one fluke dodge away from killing me at any time. Also, do you guys remember earlier when I said that Catrice was amazing and that's why I wanted her? She carries me through almost every fight and this this was no different. While she's not a fire type, she has fire type moves that deal massive damage to Verdash, making this whole experience way easier than it should have been. By the end of it, he was low health and it was me, a crossbow, and a dream. Well, I guess plus a few balls, but we got another boss checked off the list. Now for something stupid. I equipped my cold resistant armor because the snow biome was right next to me, and I ventured up the chilly mountain. I was just a tad bit curious and wanted to see what was at the top of this mountain. Nearby was Foxicles and Raindrixes, who even at a low level are lethal when not approached properly. 
properly. Luckily, with some persistence, though, I was able to get both of them. I grabbed the fast travel point and then teleported home. Busy day, I know, but listen, there's more. When I returned, I crafted the last requirement before unlocking base level 15, which was a weapon assembly line, followed by a handgun that I was hoping would be better than the crossbow. Wait, is it really day 30 already? Anyways, I woke up and got some cement crafting at my production line for hypersphere crafting at some point before doing one of the dumbest things I've ever done this entire video. I left for the snow biome again, but this time to challenge the second tower boss. I sorta kinda maybe thought that I wasn't ready, but also maybe I could be ready. I just needed to pinpoint what needed to change before actually challenging it. So here's how that went. Chick is way too strong for her own good. I think I unequip my armor here just so it doesn't break there's no point we're not getting it we only have 12 seconds there it is rough what the fight was over Day 31, I ventured off into the desert once again. I wanted to dabble in ammo crafting, so my dummy self came here for coal and sulfur. Just let it happen, guys. I'll find out eventually that it's charcoal that I need, but at the moment, whatever, just whatever. I found coal quickly and realized how heavy it was too. I only gathered a little bit before changing my attention to sulfur because that's the other resource needed for gunpowder. Sulfur is easy to find as it looks like a yellowish poop rock that sticks out. After almost maxing out my weight, I remembered Anubis lives nearby, and with him on my team, I might be able to take take down the electric tower boss, but he was stuck in a wall at a thug camp where all of the thugs around were damaging him. I mean, I guess that's great for me. This was my chance to get one of the strongest pals out there for literally zero work. When they got him somewhat low, I sweeped the camp, leaving only Anubis behind, where I started damaging him very, very slowly. I poked his head with some arrows and mounted attacks with my blue marshmallow dragon until he got to about 900 HP before he teleported back to his spawn with full HP. This was my day, but now it's ruined. Guys, I was seconds away from having myself an Anubis, except this game just like really just just did me dirty, man. Day 32, after being able to craft ammo now, I shifted my focus to a breeding farm, but it was too damn big, so I had to move stuff around first before being able to place it. Now, let's quickly touch on the breeding farm. My previous time spent in this game, I never used it, which I regret because it's single-handedly one of the strongest things in this game. Pals can be crossbred to make new pals, meaning I can mix one pal and another pal to make a completely new one, making the pal deck a lot easier to fill out. Not only can I do this, but it also has the ability to fuse good stuff stats between two pals making the ultimate pal in the end. It just takes a lot of cake and a few hours of incubating. Later that day, I headed back out to the southwest portion of the map to start discovering more of it. The only way I'm gonna find new pals is by finding new areas. Not long after, I ran across a Univolt boss that I easily captured, which got me to level 34. Only two more levels until I can fly around with my beloved Quiver. I also came across another undiscovered boss teleporter bringing me to Lenaris, who I won't be using, but here's that. All right, one more attack and then I'm calling you back. No, I'm not. One more. One more after the one more. Oh! Damn, 23,000 experience for catching a boss. Day 33, I checked on ammo crafting, which was moving at a snail's pace and almost felt like it wasn't worth it. The handgun blows through ammo and the fact that I'm only getting about 10 to 20 ammo every 30 minutes just felt pointless. I then remembered my next base upgrade. I needed an improved furnace that had the ability to smelt refined ore, which I needed for almost every late game blueprint. So I got that placed. For the remainder of the day, I went over to base two and manually farmed iron ore to speed up production. Every two days or so, so I can come here to manually farm a total of about 650 ore, which is 325 smelted ingots per two days if I keep up with it. In the evening, I did a stupid by heading towards the volcano, and I quickly learned how dangerous this area was. Flying over lava burns you no matter how high you are, and the pals here are just straight up strong. Before traveling home to sleep, I caught myself a Ragnarok, then a Pyron, followed by a Repturo. Day 34, I made my way to the small settlement to meet up with the merchant for a drug, I mean, bone purchase. Bone was hard to come by in large amounts, so I purchased more than I'd need for a while to avoid having to come back. Bone was needed for cement crafting, along with pal fluid, so this just saves me a lot of time. I returned home to craft a blue schematic crossbow, which will have a higher damage output and durability before going back to the snow biome to challenge the tower boss once again. I gathered some arrows in my new bow and put on my winter clothes, traveled back, and hopefully I'm gonna win this time. I just wasn't ready the first time. That's the, that's the big thing here. Let's go, Repturo. You've been going crazy, man. Look at that. He's already done like 20,000 damage just by himself. 
No, dude, it gets stuck on these damn pillars. Why are there even pillars in here? Let's go. We got there. Damn, what on earth is Chick doing? I came out victorious this time, with the fight being a lot easier. Shifting around pals and bringing Repturo made a world of difference. Day 35, I peeked at the requirements for cake, as I needed it for breeding, but noticed I need eggs and milk. So I deployed both my cow and chicken to the ranch, now having to just wait for the production. I then began smelting my first bit of refined ingots, which is quite expensive on the cold, but it'll be worth it. The only other thing I did on this dreadfully slow day was place my third pal box in the desert next to a huge coal deposit so i could fast travel here whenever the resources respawn to have unlimited coal day 36 i baked my first two cakes which would allow me to breed two times meaning two eggs so for now i have to choose wisely what i want to breed at least until i can bake more and now begins a huge building frenzy i wanted to snazz up my factory because i haven't touched it for a while so enjoy That's much better. Afterwards, I crafted 40 more hyperspheres for the adventures to come. Day 37, I ran the electric organ route, which is basically just a straight shot between two fast travel points in the red forest that has a lot of electric type pals. Killing or catching them gives me one organ, and I needed quote unquote 20 for a hell zephyr saddle. But in reality, this was sort of a waste of time because in the end, I chose to go with a different flyer, but we'll touch on that later. I ran the route twice and even got a lucky jolt hog, but other than that, things were pretty uneventful. I got my 23 electric organs then headed home before deciding that i was gonna try to get an anubis here's why no no get away from me you psychopath guys i don't know what the hell to do man this dude takes no damage we've done not even a thousand. Oh god he looks like lucario but way cooler and way more on crack dino sum is low-key carrying me i didn't even realize that dino sum is dead what? There was no indicator. And so the fun begins. No way. 126,000 experience. <sighs> so my current flyer alpha dran wow. he was bad bad damage defense stamina and just dreadfully slow i was looking through all of the flyers in this game and came to the conclusion that phalaris is probably the best all around but there's only two ways to get one and that's going to the forbidden islands in the four corners of the map which i'm not going to do or breeding one to get a phalaris egg you need to breed that anubis with a van worm really you know the fire farming. dragon flyer thing that i have which as you know Anyways. the only missing piece is anubis this fight took all day and all night but four dead pals and some scary closing encounters later i caught him the next day day 38 i made van worm and anubis make me a baby against their will but they gladly complied almost like they knew it was gonna happen it didn't take long for the egg to appear but it's the incubation that takes a while i headed to my desert base and placed an incubator there in hopes that it would get to 100 percent comfortability but the egg still wasn't hot enough not to mention that when the sun went down the egg was way too cold so i'm losing this no matter what i do i guess i just have Seems to just wait to one hot. hour day 39 i traveled back to mount obsidian and attempts to oh, make it to the top of the there. volcano at the mouth of it there's another tower boss plus a fast travel point that i needed to grab the flight was slow as all hell because as you know, Alpha Dran's stamina is about as good as mine. Um, well, anyways, after about five minutes, I reach the peak, but there ain't no way in hell I can fight this boss yet, so back down we go. The larger Amen. desert biome resides behind the volcano, so I jumped off and glided my way down. This desert homes different pals and another settlement with a fast travel point, so onwards we go. When I landed, I caught a Lee's Punk, a Fangalope, and an Incineram, completing the pal deck up to number 60. After some searching and grabbing a few effigies and some loot, I made my way to the dockside settlement before going home for my slumber. The mighty 
day 40 was a huge one for me. First things first, I prepped for a long trip. I knew I'd be out for a while, so stocking up on food, ammo, and making sure my armor was repaired was a must. After my morning pancakes, I teleported to the snow biome and began the trek. My plan was to head to the larger snow biome, which is much more dangerous as everything is level 33 plus. Getting there was a little tricky though. I had to fly over a large body of water before I could actually start making my way up the mountain. After grabbing a nearby fast travel point, I got startled by a black marketeer. And then my gears started turning. I knew with me being level 36 and having a way stronger team that I could probably capture him now. So here's how that went. Yo, Anubis is just getting beamed. What is he supposed to do? Get doinked, bro. No! The NPCs can take fall damage. Wow, what a fail. No way Mans goes into the mesh again, because I will be pissed if that happens to me twice. Well, that was extremely odd, but whatever, we got him. As I made my way into the deadly snow area, I spotted a Wumpo and a Wumpo baton holding hands, and if they're as weak as they are fluffy, this should be a breeze. Well, after wasting 38 spheres, I finally caught both Wumpos and found my way back home. Day 41, I woke up to a fat stack of pancakes. I also deployed the Black Marketeer to my base to see what he had in stock, and sure enough, he had an undiscovered pal for me to purchase. Later, I headed north again to further explore the large snow biome. I knew a tower boss was at the top of the mountain, but I underestimated how long the flight up would take me. I slowly flew up and up until finally reaching the peak about five to six minutes later and saw the tower was named something scary. How genetic research unit tower. Yeah, we're gonna not do that. While still on top of the mountain, I saw a third desert biome off in the distance, which I never discovered before and decided to make my way there next. I was after one thing only, which is Rayhound. This is the only area they spawn. And with this guy, my new team can be born. If you know what I'm doing with Rayhound, good on you. If not, it's a surprise. And with that, we have yet again another pal checked off the list. Day 42, I deployed Rayhound and got him and my big green panda into the breeding ranch to get another surprise egg. I wasn't quite ready to head to the four corners yet, if you know what I mean, and uh, this was my only way around it. They gave me some trouble though. I guess they weren't feeling the love flowing through the mist, but to be honest, I could care less. Just make me a damn baby. Shortly after, I noticed my huge fire Let's egg go. that I bred earlier was complete, and after hatching it, I was granted a Phalaris, which is yes, one of the best sir. flyers in the game. Okay. Unfortunately, I didn't unlock the saddle for Let's two more levels though, one. so until then it's grind time. I got my level 1 Phalaris added to my team, but it should be fairly right, easy to get it caught up to my level within a few boss fights. Time, Afterwards, my little tender game. lover pair Phalaris gifted me a huge electric egg that I got incubating. Thing. Also, I did a thing. I couldn't stand Alpha yes, Dran so right. much that for the time being, I made a Quivern saddle and realized it's actually way better. Day 43, I woke up and noticed my factory had a minor issue. Anytime I wanted pals to craft in here, it would get glitched out and show them crafting something else around the base. So I decided to demolish all of my walls and roof to see if that was the issue. And sure as balls it was. Knowing the issue was fixed, I happily left my base to go to the mini snow biome to fight the Sibylix boss. Verdash started us off with some chump change damage, but it was enough to get the job done. When I switched to Anubis mid-fight and realized that he's a straight up Chad and poops on anything in his path. Only five hyperspheres later, it was mine for the taking. When heading back to the large snow biome, I also found my first quartz node, meaning I can now make circuit boards. I mined all that that I could and returned home to craft. I got a refined metal helmet made, which I guess I've been sleeping on because the health and defense benefits were astronomical. In the dark morning of day 44, I headed back to the snow biome because Kitsune only spawns here at nighttime. I spotted one almost immediately and got to work. The capture was easy as it should be, and with it still being dark, it was back to the volcano for me. I found a Blaze Howl Noct, which is the variant version of Blaze Howl, so I didn't necessarily need it, but it looked sick as hell, so why not? Later on, I also found out Having a defensive wall at your base causes an issue to where pals will teleport outside like their damn Naruto. <laughs> so, I deconstructed some of that wall to fix that. For the rest of the day, me and Quivern attempted to make dumb muds and dictoses go extinct by killing every last one. They both dropped a good amount of high quality oil, which is needed to craft polymer, and I think I need that for something, right? Day 45, I rearranged my base yet again for more efficient workflow, and it's a lot more open now. We got a sphere assembly line 2 crafted as well, allowing me to craft ultra and legendary spheres whenever I get them unlocked, of course. For ultra spheres, I needed power 
palladium, carbon fiber, refined ingots, cement, some other stuff, I think. But basically, they're expensive as all hell, especially playing on single player. After Bob the Builder playtime was over, I went to the merchant to sell more of my boss trophies. I was hoping either he or another merchant would be selling pal fluids, but that wasn't the case, so getting them the old-fashioned way was all I could do. Killing every gobfin for the pain they've caused me in the past. <sighs> After racking up a generous amount of pal fluids, I felt satisfied enough to go home. Day 46, I headed to an undiscovered area and attempts to get a relaxa- relaxo- relaxasaur- relaxaurus. Relaxasaurus! They look like Blue's Clues and a T-Rex had a baby, but also like, uh, actually, I don't know what the hell this thing is, but I need one. Or maybe 10. I caught everyone in this general area, hoping for some good stats, but they all sucked. I was trying to breed the ultimate pal with triple gold stats, but all of these Relaxauruses didn't give me crap. While waiting on them to respawn, I took on the Relaxaurus Lux boss, which looks like a legit live animation cartoon character, but nonetheless, it's another pal I need. Capturing went smoothly, as you could guess, and I went straight back to farming the regular ones right outside. After getting straight poop for about 10 minutes, I finally left with 11 blue dinosaurs. Returning home not long after, I erected a pal condenser, which confused four of the same pals into one pal to make a slightly stronger one. And finally, after my six-day breeding frenzy, it's time to breed the ultimate mother-loving pal. I threw a Laxaurus and Grizzbolt into the breeder and waited not so patiently. I kicked off day 47 by crafting some cloth. It was the last thing I needed before making the Falera saddle and taking flight on one of the fastest pals. I got the saddle queued and let my friends finish it up, and I went to grab my huge dragon egg that looked sick. I got the egg set, but I noticed it was at 50% comfortability because it was slightly cold. So my first instinct was to build a million campfires behind the incubators. When construction finished, the eggs were still slightly cold, so F me, am I right? Anyways, time for the first ever flight with Phalaris. After having my fun, it was back to business by heading to the huge lake in the west for someone we all know and love. That's right, Gyarados himself. Not really, his name is Jormantide, and he low-key looks ten times cooler than Gyarados, but you see the similarities, right? He just used Hydro Cannon. It missed. That's what I'm talking about, 198 damage. This whole capture went on for way too long, bringing us into the Dark Hours, where I finally caught the big sea dragon, and with that, my team got a huge upgrade. Let's go! Let's go! Day 48, I sadly removed Quivern from my team to replace it with Jormantide, as Quivern was all around my weakest pal. You will forever be remembered, my beautiful white angel dragon. Most of day 48 was strictly for farming and crafting, and I'll save you the boredom, but I gathered all the coal possible in the desert for refined ingot smelting, and also crafted my first few Ultra Spheres. I also got Masanda and Patalia breeding for yet again another rare pal that I'd otherwise have to go to hell to catch. Later on, I kept my promise to you guys that I made on day one, and here it is. I headed back to the beginning to catch the big green booger known as the Memorist boss. And it was actually really easy and a letdown seeing as I could just fly around on Phalaris and deal massive fire damage from range. It was a quick encounter with me capturing him and going back to the big desert to fight the new boss on the map. Wasn't here long though until I came across one of the most OP pals that I have seen to date being a lucky dinosome Lux. Did I mention it was level 50? No? Okay, yeah, it was level 50. I knew it would be hard to deal with, but damn, not this bad. Dude, I, I messed that up. That was my fault. He's almost to the point of being able to be caught. Oh my gosh. I can't stand that move, man. Anubis just teleports through this crap like it's nothing. It's crazy, man. It's just that... He's the definition of a Chad. Somehow it hits me every freaking time. Let's go! No, no! It's day 49, and I kid you not, it's been 24 minutes since I started fighting this thing, and I've only gotten it to one-third health, which is embarrassing to say the least. I finally got it low enough and realized that I wasn't even able to use hyperspheres on it. What? The chances were too low, and the sphere bounced right off, meaning I had 11 chances to capture it with my ultra spheres that I just crafted. I threw all 11, never even getting close to capturing it, so I left it behind in hopes that it would live to see me another day. Now we fight the menacing boss that I came here for. This pal looked intimidating as hell, but hopefully he's no match for my god squad. It took some dancing and a few close calls with me capturing yet another beastly pal. At this point in the game, most things that I capture are going to be strong. It just comes down to what I want my team to look like and who I want my team to be. Guys, we are halfway through at day 50, and after skipping out on sleep, I found a desert settlement which I thought would be cooler, but turned out to be the same as all the other ones. A few cops, some merchants, and NPCs that did absolutely nothing except stand there. Basically a waste of five minutes worth of flying. 
Okay, now, the time and moments we've all been waiting for. My number one anticipated pal since day one is ready to be hatched. Come to me, my beautiful electric dragon. Okay, 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 here's what he looks like. And now that the fun is over, it's AFK time at base two. To finish off this lovely day, I figured I'd share that since day one, I've been saving all of the pal souls that I came across to get Orzerk maxed out ASAP when I got him. You can bring these souls to a statue of power to permanently increase health, attack, defense, and work speed on any pal. So Orzerk, being my favorite, gets all the love first. I got everything other than work speed to the highest I could, and once he reaches my level, he should be the craziest DPS pal ever. Day 51, I got a second improved furnace placed for more efficient ingot production. Ingot crafting is slowish, so having two of these bad boys would make me rich in no time. For the first 10 minutes of the day, I farmed coal as it's needed for refined ingots, and you can never have too much. This huge farming craze was for hyperspheres. I wanted to stock up on around 100 plus, so I'd never come across another lucky pal and leave empty-handed. Plus, it's just good to be prepared. I also crafted a refined metal pickaxe, which I've been missing out on, seeing as I didn't know it existed. Better quality means faster farming and better rates, which saves me a lot of time. In the evening, I tested out Orzerk for the very first time, which left me completely speechless and to be honest i think i'm quite unstoppable now what the hell this man is insane i wasn't expecting that he's aquaman but lightning hold the hell up did y'all see the spear thing y'all had to see it that what what the hell day 52 my lilene egg was ready for hatching meaning another pal deck number checked off and also a good planter i guess i also crafted some refined metal armor which will offer me even more health and defense than the previous armor basically what i'm getting at is a lot of home chores were involved today but guys it's a survival game it can't be all fun the entire time there will for sure be days where i don't leave my base once because I need spheres and there's like 10 steps involved. By the end of the day, I had 101 ultra spheres crafted and a lot of leftover resources, leaving me feeling great about the coming days. Day 53, I began crafting high quality cloth so I could make a giga glider, which is just a faster version of the basic one. And then shortly after, I also crafted a legendary refined helmet schematic that I found. It was expensive as all hell, but I knew it'd be worth it. So I got started. The rest of the day was back to farming coal and iron for refined ingots as everything at this point needed it. Oh, by the way, check out this legendary helmet. I guess I did one more thing. At night, I crafted the Grizzbolt minigun for the memes, which lets you mount Grizzbolt and then left clicking, he pulls out a freaking Gatling gun. And I gotta say, I'm excited to use it. In day 54, I immediately left home to start farming bosses for XP to level up Grizzbolt. I need him to be a higher level before the minigun would be viable. I started with Lunaris, which I decided to catch, but it still offers the same, if not more XP. Next was Elizabeth, which was an easy fight after her little suicide minions are dead. And then when I finished up with with Grizzbolt, he was around level 34, which I assumed would be good enough for now. These low-level bosses weren't doing it for me, and uh, I wanted to test myself and try something that I knew would be way too hard. And that was going for the level 49 Blazemut boss in the volcano biome. Here's how that went. I'm gonna go in here. This might be a terrible idea. Normatide's doing okay. No, he's after me, though. His moveset seems pretty basic so far. What?! I guess I heavily underestimated this guy. Yeah, guys, like I knew it was going to be hard, but to get side pieced like that just left me embarrassed. Day 55, I made my way back into the cave naked and fearing for my life. All I got to do is retrieve my stuff and leave. Simple. Wait, what? Sizen, wh what are you doing? He's too strong. Just leave. Yeah, your boy tried again. Here's attempt number two. No way I just stepped in lava. No, I'm going to die here. Son of a... And then after all that, I died a third time due to overheating while trying to retrieve my gears. So <laughs> tomorrow's a new day. I hate this game so much. Yes, I do. I hate it so much. Day 56, my pinky was tired from holding shift. My middle finger was tired from holding W because of the amount of times I died and having to fly all the way back to the cave. But nonetheless, here's attempt number four. Attempt four took me 30 minutes because I was terrified of getting trick shotted by this man again. So I hid in the hallway where Blazemut couldn't reach me and used Grizzbolt, who was my last living pal, to slowly dwindle his health before finally capturing him. And this concludes this awful yet very successful day. We got it! 
Oh my gosh. No freaking way. Day 57, I put Valet in my team, which is a little green and purple floating pal who has a very Valet. unique ability. When I have Valet deployed, defeating ground type pals drops more of their specific loot, which was perfect because later crafting items needed circuit boards, which needed high quality cloth, which needed pal oil. And you get that from killing ground types such as Dumb Mud and Digtoes. So to the desert we go. Well, first I have to test out Blazemut. And yes, he's crazy and literally left me speechless. After that, I spent the rest of my day killing landfish and turtles in the desert for my needed resources, as I explained before. Day 58, I ventured into the large snow biome to get the other resource needed for circuit boards, which is raw quartz. I just gotta fly around, hit all these nodes, and we'll be good to go. When I was finished, I returned home to craft as many boards as possible. The rest of the day was a bust. I have no clue what happened, really. Day 59, it was back to the desert time. Pal oil is at the top of my priority list, and unfortunately, these pals only drop one to three per kill, so this is gonna take me a while. After wiping out the sea creature population, I crafted an electrical heater back at the base. What this does is it basically has one of my kindling pals keep it lit for heating the area for eggs. And with this, all of my incubating eggs were at a comfortable 100%, finally. After getting that settled, I hatched an Orzerk egg, which by the way, I guess I should tell you what I'm doing here. In the background, I have my Grisbolt and Relaxaurus breeding 24-7 to pop out Orzerk eggs for consolidation. For the first time, fusing four Orzerks into my current one will give them a stat boost, and it can be done up to four times. I'll touch more on this later when I actually do it though. Day 6 60 was back to farming iron and coal. Nothing to see here. Nothing important or interesting. Just me, your boy, hitting a rock with my stick. It's a great time. Day 61, I began a giant project that I kind of underestimated. I wanted to redo my entire base layout because it was sloppy and it's been bugging me for 60 days now. The craze began with me breaking down my walls then dismantling a lot of the stuff I had already placed to make room for more foundations. I moved the logging and mining site over to base two so I could free up some space here. I couldn't finish everything today, but I'll catch you guys up tomorrow when I start to make some real progress. For something important though, like I said earlier, I've been hatching extra Orzerks so I could do a power up by consolidating and here's what that looks like. A jump in all stats by around 30 to 50 plus 200 health is a pretty decent boost for just fusing extra pals. Day 62, the refurbishing continued. I won't walk you through every little thing that I moved and swapped and did, but something I did want to point out is the storage room I made, which I was extremely proud of. I fully organized my materials, making my life a whole lot easier when it came to finding stuff that I needed. The rest of the day, I continued on this project, which I didn't expect to take this long, but hey, good stuff takes time, you feel? Day 63, base shenanigans continued, starting with a little kitchen area, followed by a lot more reorganizing. The base was almost where I wanted it to be, I just needed to get through this final little push. By the end of it, this is what things were looking like, and I gotta say, it's looking good. By the time I was done, the day was already coming to a close, but I did finish things off by deleting every gobfin in the world for pal fluids, as I feel like a lot of legendary spheres will be in my near future, which requires cement. Day 64, I woke up and checked my map to see what was still undiscovered, and honestly, there's a lot. I wanted to definitely get the whole map uncovered by day 100, and if I'm gonna do this, I need to start now. I started off at the southmost part of the map and worked my way around. This was a two birds with one stone type of situation because not only was I discovering unseen parts of the map, but I was also finding the little green lift monk effigies all over the place, and in the long run, like you've heard me say before, increases the capture rate on pals. Nothing interesting happened while in the south as it's a starting spawn area. As a sun went down, I found a few more effigies and decided to call it a day. Day 65, I got right back to it. After some more exploration, I ended up at the volcano again, but I realized that half of it was still undiscovered. I made my way up trying to see if there was anything I had missed, and unfortunately, I came across a level 49 lucky Pyron, which I should have passed on, but when I see stuff like this, I just can't. I have to get it. Meaning now I gotta spend the rest of my much needed daylight to fight and capture it, and I literally did just that. <sighs> see you guys tomorrow. Day 66, I was still out searching the area with no sleep and bloodshot eyes. I found one of the four corner islands, which I wasn't quite ready to hit yet, but I guess it's good knowledge knowing where it is. Now it's time to uncover the entire right half of the volcano, which took some time. I flew along the big wall for a good five minutes before realizing it was just for looks, but I did realize a new boss popped up on my map, and you know I can't resist. So I headed all the way back down to where I started and found a cave entrance. This was one of the scariest fights I've had yet, because to be honest with you guys, I've never fought this guy before, and I didn't even know he existed. Blazemud showed his true strength during this fight by completely solo melting Astagon, getting his health low quick, and allowing me to capture one of the coolest looking pals in this game. When I left the cave, I flew around to the other side of the volcano that I haven't seen yet, and deep down, I knew something didn't feel right. This area looked way too badass and way too endgame to be just nothing. And sure as genitals, after checking the map, I learned that one of the few legendary pals was over here, who goes by the name of Jet Ragon. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. 
ready? I'm leaving. Day 67, before going out, I upgraded my capture power at the statue, getting it to level 8 out of 10 with those little effigies I've been finding. And then I made a terrible decision. I returned to Mount Obsidian to fight the next tower boss. I've been putting it off because I know what's in here and I'm scared to fight it, but I need to beat it at some point. After this one, there's still two others that are way more difficult, which doesn't excite me either. May I present to you, Axel and Orzerk. Yep, I gotta fight an Orzerk. That's not mine. Except this one's a boss. Axel and Orzerk. Here we go, man. You know what? I heavily believe in Anubis. I'm gonna get as far away from this Orzerk as possible, though, because if he uses that one move, you know, the red ring of death. Oh, he's gonna use it. He's gonna use it. I'm stuck! Oh, why can't I run over there? My Orzerk's kind of cracked. I mean, well, defense-wise, at least. Get away, get away, get away. I don't trust you. I only have five minutes left, guys. Six minutes. Yes, the fight drug out and went the full 10 minutes with me falling just short of winning. Also, I lose my mind when I die after the time runs out, but turns out that that's how the game works. If you can't beat the boss in the time, it just instantly kills you. That's so stupid. 8,000 health left. And I die again for no reason. How are you going to call a timeout and then kill me? Day 68, before going to get my belongings, I made some heat-resistant refined armor, which offers more protection in the heat and looks badass while doing it. Afterwards, I made some incendiary grenades and grabbed my pistol and ammo, along with a slightly different team, to attempt to beat Axel and Orzerk again. The whole fight took a full 10 minutes again with me falling short on damage and dying. I came to the conclusion that my pals don't have enough time to do the full 130,000 damage they need to do within 10 minutes, so I need more help. They aren't dying, they just don't have the time. So I need to wait until I'm level 43 before I can make a pump shotgun with shotgun ammo, and then maybe we can take the win. Day 69, I did something three times as stupid by heading back to the volcano to try and capture the jet Ragon. I brought my strongest possible team and hope for the best. Here's how that went. Okay, we just oh, we just almost killed Blaze Mutt with one attack. Love to see it, fam. Love to see it. Anubis is so buggy, man. Why? Can someone do something, please? That was good. Yeah. Guys, I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough, and I want to leave. That made me want to die. I'm just that weak. Oh my gosh. Feeling defeated, I fled from the fight and went back home with my tail tucked between my legs. Turns out I'm a lot weaker than I thought. Later that day, after doing some thinking, I figured that the Jet Ragon could be taken down with Ice Pals since they're super effective. One of the strongest ones in mind isn't even an Ice type, but it has Ice type moves, which is Lily knocked. The cave resides in the snow biome, and based on what I know now, don't take this fight lightly. Her being 49 doesn't help things at all, but on top of it, her damage reduction is so high that dealing big damage wasn't an option. It was a slow, drawn out fight, and 10 hyperspheres later, I caught the Lylene by nightfall. Let's go! Day 70. I'm not even gonna attempt to hide the fact that I did absolutely nothing. I've gotten my ass handed to me for the past few days, and I just wanted to relax with my pals at home. I'm gonna cook and play fetch, but I'll come back tomorrow well rested, I promise. Day 71. Began with the crafting of a pump shotgun. Hopefully this bad boy can help with the DPS during some of these harder fights. This was obviously followed by gunpowder and shotgun shell crafting, which wasn't too expensive seeing as charcoal's easy and sulfur's all over the desert biomes. Other than that, the day consisted of more map uncovering, fighting bosses, and activating fast travel points whenever I came across them was the name of the game. Day 72, I cooked up some decent food and gathered iron while waiting on shotgun shells to craft. That was all I was waiting on before re-attempting the Orzerk fight, which I was determined to beat. After gathering ammo and my best pals, I traveled to the boss tower and loaded in. This time around, I really focused on holding down the trigger to the shotgun the entire time. Like I said before, the time limit is the issue here, not staying alive, so constant DPS is a must. This run was going a lot smoother than before, with me already getting his health to under half within 6 minutes remaining. Blazemod really showed his true strength throughout this fight as well. In my opinion, fighter types are the strongest in the game because they're the only element with a burn effect that deals massive damage over time. With a good amount of time to spare, I dealt the final blow and took the crown, baby. Come on, give me that 48, 30, the blue! 
Let's go. Let's go. Day 73, I hatched the last few Orzurks I needed to get my current one to plus two stars at the condenser, which in total gave him a boost of 70 points in all areas. Shortly after, I went AFK for a while while metal smelted and circuit boards crafted because the next thing on my list was constructing a level two assembly line, nice. which unlocks the next shield. I then, of course, got the hyper shield crafted. And when all was finished, I headed back out for exploration, which seems to be my daily routine now. I'm going to search these lands far and wide every day until I discover every square inch possible. I found myself back in the large snow biome, but this time it was searching the left side, which hadn't been discovered yet. And if we follow the trend of legendaries being in these harsh biomes next to cool landmarks, I feel like I'll be rolling up on one shortly. When the sun went down, I found a king pack, a crisp boss, and I finished him off for some easy XP before attempting to find one of the last pals I needed for the pal deck. Mirath only spawns in the large snow area and only at nighttime, which luckily didn't take me long. I got one located and captured within seconds, and with that, I only need to capture all the legendaries before I can officially say that I'm done with the entire pal deck. Well, every pal minus one, but we'll get there. Day 74, the search continued when I immediately rolled up on a frost stallion, being the snow biome's legendary pal. The only difference is this guy had a way larger health pool than Jet Dragon, making it an intimidating encounter. I fled as I wasn't quite ready to fight it, but soon enough I'd come back to give it my best shot. But with that, I had every bit of the snow biome uncovered, and it was time for me to move on to another portion of the map. I returned home to use some of the pal souls that I've been finding to continue leveling Orzurk's stats. And to my surprise, he was fully maxed out, meaning this boy's fit to be strong as hell. Day 75, I left the base to find the last few effigies I needed before leveling my capturing power to 9, meaning soon enough, very few pals will be able to escape my pal sphere wrath. So of course, before encountering any more pals, I headed home to talk with my statue of power. With this, I only needed the large desert biome fully uncovered before I was done with the entire map. But until then, I wanted to level up a bit. I had a boss route that I liked running for levels as it was fast and efficient. So here's that. First, I fight Anubis since he steps away from my fast travel point in the desert. This is around 130,000 experience. And then following this is Jormanside and then Lily Knox. After all three, I return home for a drop off. And by then, the Anubis respawns. So rinse and repeat. This was the most efficient way for me to gain about a level once every few days. Day 76, I took my very first trip to one of the Forbidden Pal Islands to see if I could find someone I was longing for. These islands home the strongest pals and some pretty crazy variants like Jormantide Ignis. Everything on this specific island next to the volcano is level 40 and above, which makes catching this stuff even more enticing. But the island I needed to be at was by the large desert biome, because there were Shadowbeak spawns at a very low rate. Shadowbeak is one of the most powerful pals in the entire game, minus legendaries, and I had to get my hands on one. Day 77, after a long flight, I discovered the best island of them all being number 3, which is the Shadowbeak spawn. Now I gotta hang out here and wipe the pals over and over, trying to force one to spawn. There were Blazemuts, Bushies, Lylines, and a bunch of other really powerful pals, so hopefully this doesn't take too long. I fought through all of the pals here, capturing or killing them, but still no Shadowbeak by sunrise. Oh, also, you're probably noticing that it says criminal activity underway on my screen, but here's the thing. It's basically just a warning stating that when PDIF shows up, if they spot me, I'll pretty much be screwed until I die. So it's best that we just avoid them when they make an appearance. Well, this is what I thought until they showed up, spotted me, and began bullying me and my pals, getting me to one star. Honestly, I just let Blazemud murder them all, and the once it went away, so screw it. I'm just gonna stay here. Also, I killed a Bushi who decided to post-death breakdance through the air, and I can honestly say I was impressed. Day 78 involved a lot of chores, to say the least. I began smelting a lot of pal metal for legendary spheres and some later game armor and saddles. I got a few legendary spheres crafted, and while I was at it, I crafted more ammo too. When I finished up, I went back to the pal sanctuary island to hopefully find a shadow beak this time. Yes, there's a way to breed one, but I wanted the satisfaction of actually finding and capturing one. I spent the rest of the day here, and even found a lucky level 50 Fangalope, who I tussled with for a while before capturing. I fought all night, wiping pals, forcing new ones to spawn, with no luck yet. Day 79, I figured instead of showing you the ridiculous amount of pal cruelty performed on this island, that I'd spare y'all's holy eyes, the pain and suffering, and just tell you, I spent the entire day killing pals on the island, and by the end of it, still no shadow beak. I gave up and decided to do some boss runs for XP, as I was close to level 45, and obviously, I want to hit level 50 before the video's over. Anubis, Jormantide, Lylene Noct, and a few others were once again wiped from the face of this earth before calling it a day. Maybe the next 20 days will be in our favor because I still have so much work to do. Day 80, all I did was farm coal and sulfur for ammo. There's nothing to see here. Okay, just move along. Day 81 was back to the Pal Sanctuary Island yet again because I was determined and I don't like giving up. I saw a few of the 
the other rare pals, such as Astagon and Lylene, but still no friggin' Shadow Beak. There's no statistics online yet about spawn rate of these majestic birds, but I'm willing to bet it's as low as 0.1%. I unfortunately called it quits officially this time because I already had both pals I needed to be able to breed Shadow Beaks, so I headed home and got both Kitsune and Astagon in the breeding ranch. Before long, I'll have my bird and I'll be damn near unstoppable. Day 82, I got my first Shadow Beak egg set in the incubator, but I didn't stop there. I allowed Kitsune and Astagon to continue breeding to give me four more eggs on top of the original Shadow Beak for condensing. Also, now that I'm level 45, I can craft assault rifle ammo, which is huge. The shotgun alone won't bring me to victory in these boss fights, but adding an assault rifle in the mix will help me drastically. Later in the day, I found myself in the large desert biome to finish up exploring the rest of the map when I remembered there could be a legendary here. It would only make sense for the final one to appear at some point in the desert, but at the moment, I found absolutely nada. So to finish off the day, I grinded XP by fighting Menesting yet again. Day 83, while still adventuring, I figured I'd try to get the last 32 effigies I needed for maximum capturing power. And since it's still dark out, it'll be a lot easier. Before the sun rose, I'm pretty sure just in this one trip, I already found around 10 to 15, so this should be a breeze. While fighting the Menesting last night, I managed to grab a purple refined armor schematic from the chest in that cave, which I had the ability to craft, and boy, should this increase my survivability. Here are the stats, by the way. My armor is done. Okay, so the regular refined metal armor is 150 defense, 500 health, 1500 durability. 1500, no, no, whatever. 225, 750, 3000. Oh my god! Shortly after, I began prepping for the next tower boss fight, meaning I have to grab all of my best water types, being three Jormantides. And immediately after, I headed out for the challenge. Ah, oh, here we go. I already know how strong this damn mother is. As you can see, the boss was a Phalaris, which being on the other side of was quite scary. This Phalaris was different though, since he had counter moves for water types being a few electric attacks. This is going to be a tough fight. It was down to the oh wire gosh, with me having just 18 seconds left, but I knew the victory was mine. Let's go! Oh, that was way too close. At the start of day 84, my long-awaited Shadow Beak was ready to be born, and with that, here's what he looks like. Unfortunately, I couldn't ride him until level 47, but that gives me some time to level him up and get him stronger before then. Also, not sure why I thought it would be a good idea to go take on the legendary Jet Ragon again, but let's get it, I guess. If I can capture this thing, I will have the best possible chance at beating this game. Lylene started us off with very little damage, but it was still enough to progress the fight. I helped out a little here and there with rifle damage, but again, it wasn't much. My best chance at beating him was using Blazemot for burn damage. It, it doesn't care about defense, seeing as it's a set amount of damage. After about five minutes, he was already at half health, and I knew with patience I could get this done. I had to swap my pals out very patiently and with perfect timing to prevent deaths and stay on top of my game as Jet Dragon attacks every two seconds, so there's very little room for error. Ugh, day 85. I was still out fighting Jet Ragon, tired as hell and ready for a nap, but I can't give up. I'm so close to finishing this, so let's get it done. By midday, I finally had it low enough to begin capturing, and now the rest of this comes down to luck. Four spheres later, and an ass load of beginner's luck, I caught the Space Dragon, and it was mine for the taking. I returned home immediately to add him to my team, but much like Shadow beak i'd have to wait until a later level before writing him the sick thing about legendaries though is when you capture them their health doesn't scale back down it stays at the wild health multiplier which in this case it was 10,980. when the celebration was finished i crafted my first and last set of pal metal armor which is the final tier of armor in the game and it's for sure sexy as hell day 86 i brought jet ragon along for a boss run to test him out just like all of my other new pals and i'll let it speak for itself he literally melted anubis letting me know that that if he fights something he's super effective against, it's just over. The remainder of the day was devoted to gathering sulfur, charcoal, and iron for ammo crafting. That's really all I needed to focus on for the rest of the playthrough. The last pals I'm missing are three legendaries, which we'll touch on later, and I only need to defeat one more boss. With those requirements complete, I'll have beaten the game and completed this challenge. Day 87 began with an effigy run during the dark hours to finish up my capturing power increase. I wanted to do this not only for bragging rights, but also for an easier time 
capturing the last three legendaries in the game. By sunrise, I had all of the effigies I needed, getting my capturing power to max level. I then headed back to the desert for another XP run when I noticed that was getting raided. These are always so satisfying with Orzerk because he can one-tap the entire raid. Anyways, back to it. After running through the bosses one more time, Shadow Beak should be caught up to my level and actually usable. When I returned home, I crafted a sword because for some reason it's a late game weapon and I figured I'd give it a shot. All I'm gonna say is it's either gonna be really good or really bad. To finish off the day, I made my way to Frost Stallion since I was still high from capturing Jet Ragon, which went into the night and it was exhausting to say the least. I was still taking on Frost Stallion on day 88 and it was going quite well. I hadn't had a single death yet and the Great Ice Legendary was low on health, so I could begin capturing soon. Unfortunately, Jet Ragon is a literal crackhead and sent Frost Stallion flying for some odd reason, leading to it dying from fall damage. Son of a buns, bro! He took fall damage! Yes, they respawn, but I just spent 30 minutes fighting this just for it to die, which is extremely demoralizing. We finished off the day with more iron farming. As you can see, when we near the end, a lot of things become repetitive, and that's not because that's how the game is, but I only have 12 days left to beat the game, so XP and ammo is the main focus. Day 89, it was back to the snow biome for me. I was dead set on capturing this Frost Stallion, and I will stop at nothing until he's mine. But everything happens for a reason, and this one had even more health than the last one, making me assume that this one was better, but we'll see. This time, I was a little more prepared team-wise with Double Phalaris, Blazemut, and Jet Ragon, so hopefully this goes a lot quicker. By midday, Frost Alien was already at half health and just a few burns away from being mine. This time, I know to put Jet Ragon away as he gets low, so I don't go killing him again. It was a long and tedious battle, but by evening, I was able to get him to capturing range with my rifle. This was my longest no fight yet, way. putting us at around the 18-minute mark, which is absolutely asinine, but worth it, I think so. It only took me three spheres to capture, showing the true strength of leveling my capturing power to 10 with those effigies. I returned home, and I think I was delirious from all the fighting and dodging for 20 minutes straight. Ugh, your boy definitely needs some sleep. I woke up day 90 with ammo on my mind. I got 410 assault rifle ammo crafting, but something else was bothering me, and that was the sanity drain on my team. Each pal I had could only fight one fight before their sanity was all the way at zero, which that was expensive food-wise to get back to 100. So I big-brained the situation by assigning my cotton candy lamb to the ranch, which will generate cotton candy over time. This beautiful delicacy was a decent sanity food, and I'm getting it for free, so that's all the better. Afterwards, I'm sure you can guess what I did, but it was time for another boss run. I'm extremely close to level effective. 47, and I also needed to test out Frost Stallion. I don't think I need to say much, but Frost Stallion is definitely my strongest pal, hands down. When the fight was over, I leveled up, granting oh me access right, to the much-needed be Shadow Beak saddle, and let me tell you, this game is about to get crazy. I obviously went straight home to craft the saddle, and by the way, let's just take a moment to say that Anubis is by far the best crafter in the game, if you wanted to know. He has tier 4 handiwork, which is the highest you can get, and he's making the saddle look like light work. And now, for the test run with my beautiful bird. So day 90 has been pretty eventful, but it doesn't end there. I got greedy, so and with fast. my newfound strength, I think I'm allowed to, but Jet Ragon respawned, and I've returned to get a second one! What an excellent way to finish off day 90. But now, the real grind begins. Our final 10 days are here. Day 91, I brought Shadow Beak out to test him for real, because because I have yet to let him fight an entire battle. If he can kill Jormantide easily, then I think I'll go ahead and keep him on my team. Oh my what? lordy! What in the He's nine lives did I just witness? Shadow be dealing exactly. this much damage to his weakness type is godlike. He can stay on my team forever, absolutely. I was doing one final boss run with Shadow Beak to get him up to level 47 before attempting the Palladius and Necromus encounter. Just look at how easily he takes care of Anubis. After the one more fight with Lylene Knox, Shadow Beak was caught up with my level, and I felt somewhat ready. Time to head home and get some rest before a grueling battle with two legendaries at the same exact time. Day 92, I went straight out to the desert and was looking down at the twin legendaries. One neutral and one dark. Both level 50. We got this right? Maybe? This was by far one of the most difficult things I've done in this game so far. Having to focus not only two different pals at the same time, but the fact that they are both capable of melting me within seconds also makes it 10 times harder. This was a test of patience and timing. Towards the end of the day, Necromus was getting really low on health, but I didn't want to celebrate early. I chipped away a little bit more before beginning the capture phase. I threw most of my spheres please, just please. for this to happen. Needless to say, I've had enough for the day. No way!
They should not be able to attack when they're physically not on the planet Earth. Day 93, I began constructing another base behind my current one for wheat farming. I took down the POW station in the desert near the coal so I could do this because sanity and food was an issue at the moment. I got my wheat plots down and my POW beds placed before deploying my best planters and waterers to get the job done. Hopefully in a day or two, I won't have to worry about food ever again. Today was mostly catch up and replenish as I had nearly no spheres left, armor was broken, and I needed food. I crafted more spheres, which would hopefully be enough to catch me the twins. To finish things off, I did a glitched out Anubis fight, which got me to level 48, leaving me two more levels before being maxed out. Day 94, I went to capture my third jet Ragon, and here's why. The final boss is Shadowbeak, who is a dark type pal with 200,000 health. It's going to be the hardest fight in the game, no doubt, because of the time limit, but its weakness is dragon types. And if I have three of the Sorry, best the pal in the doing, game, man? what could go wrong? I've done this fight so many times now that it was pretty simple and straightforward. Day 95, I was finishing up the battle with Jet Ragon, followed by an easy three sphere capture. This officially completed my final team, which consisted of three Jet Ragons, one Shadow Beak, and one Frost Allium. Very few things from here forward are going to be able to kill all five. It's just me, myself, and I that I'm worried about. Later on, I checked on my wheat at my new farm, which had already produced 435, meaning it's time to cook, ladies and gentlemen. In all reality, I just made an ass load of pancakes. I should have an easier time now dealing with low sanity and food. And if you didn't know, the reason keeping food on your pals above 50% is important is because they get a huge decrease in all of their stats, and obviously we don't want that. Day 96, my boy Blazemut got me and my team up to level 49, which is huge. With this, I was feeling more confident in my power level and decided to give the it's twins so another easy. go. Back to the desert to try again. This run went a lot better with me getting Necromus down to 122 health within 7 minutes. Pretty sure this is record timing, to be honest. About 10 spheres later, Necromus was oh, mine, and I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Fighting only one Palladius by himself Damn, should be a breeze. Dude. A few minutes later, I began gunning down the Link Zelda Stallion before now capturing it on my fourth sphere. One. Day 97, I was I'm one boss fight you. away from being level 50. Well, let me rephrase that. I was 50,000 experience away from leveling up, and for some reason, I thought Pen King would get me there. I wanted to kill him to level up because that's where the whole playthrough started when he killed me at the beginning, you know? But here's that awkward encounter. All right. Well, it was worth a shot. Anyways, yeah, so maybe not the final kill before level 50. I instead went to Verdash, who used to be a challenge, but this time I literally one-shot him. And still, I needed 15,000 more experience. Ugh, this is not supposed to be going this way. And now for the final kill before level 50. Right when I left the Verdash arena, there were two suicide bees who should get me there. Now that they're dead and I'm level 50, it's time for my very last assignment before the final boss, which is crafting the Jetragon saddle, which is quite expensive, but I have all the materials, so who cares? Oh, I'm level 50! <laughs> it didn't even show me. It didn't even give me the level up animation. Day 98, my Jet Ragon oh my saddle gosh, was finished, fast. and I have literally oh zero words gosh, for how broken this is. Fast. I spent the next few minutes being in awe by this pal, just flying around at hyper speeds and having my fun. Day 99, I chose to do the final boss fight so I could have a nice and relaxing day 100, and also just in case there was anything else after beating the final boss that I have to do. But the moments that this entire entire video has led up to is finally here. May I introduce to you. Scared. I only get one shot at this. I only get one shot. I don't have time to craft the ammo. Yo, why is this guy like the main character? Holy hell. Oh my god. Yo, they made an entrance for this man. Oh, I'm so freaking terrified. 200k health too. This is not gonna be a breeze whatsoever. A few minutes in, I seem to be doing really good damage, but that could change at any time. 200,000 health is a huge obstacle, and it's gonna come down to mere seconds, I promise you. Why don't I have that attack? Oh my gosh. That almost obliterated me. By the five minute mark, I had the boss's health right at half, and I was absolutely stressing. Unfortunately, near the end, my assault rifle broke, making my damage output about 90% less, and ruining my chances at winning. This is my fault though, I should have been prepared and brought in multiple guns, but I will fight until the very last second. The fight timed out with me getting the boss's health to just 14,000, but it wasn't enough to take the win. That was the difference of me bringing in a second assault rifle, and I'm beating myself up over it to this day. Damn it, damn it, damn it!
Eh, screw it. We made it to day 100, which is a huge achievement. So who cares if I lost that fight? I pretty much, you know, I basically won, right? Anyways, like I said, day 100 is finally here, my friends. And damn, has this journey been eventful. Today is going to be slow, as there's not much else for me to do on this island, other than thank my pals for fighting for me and giving me comfort in my times of loneliness. I'm going to hang out with my friends and eat some pancakes while we enjoy our final day here. Thank you all so much for sticking around until the end of this amazing 100 days. I've had loads of fun playing this game, and it won't be the last time either. Until next time, my friends, I love you all. Don't forget to like and subscribe, nerds!